Hello and welcome to the Viva Bastardo show, part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. Today we have as our guest Mark Cho, founder of the Armory and owner of Drake's. He's a clothing impresario. We talk about clothes, about words around clothes. We talk about watches and the fascinating kind of collaborations he's done with extraordinary people like F.P. Jean and, and Moza. Uh, we have a group nap halfway through the interview. And uh, let's get into it. This podcast is brought to you by Economy Signs, the specialty company. It's a father and son joint. Uh, they've been in business since 1973, and they work on everything from spec Miatas to cars formerly driven by Paul Newman. Uh, they have an incredibly deep archive of brand decals from old races like they did Toner in the 70s, and they specialize in vintage motorsport liveries. Is it liveries or livery? Anyway, they have, they've done a ton of vintage Ferraris and priceless cars with history. Uh, if you've been to any vintage race in the USA, I'm sure you've seen their work. They do paint and vinyl, which is handy if you don't want to ruin your car. And they do any kind of thing, mo dragsters, motorcycles, stock cars, uh, scooters. Well, maybe not. But anyway, check them out. They're fantastically talented. This podcast is also brought to you by Inbound Motorsports. Uh, Rami, the main geezer who runs it, says a lot of you have been reaching out. Please continue to do so. He can bring in cars from anywhere, Japan, Europe, uh, Asia, which is also Japan. Um, he's bringing a ton of stuff. I think uh, there's been a strange peak of interest in Mitsubishi Pajero Evolutions. I don't know why. But anyway, give Rami a call. He's the most delightful guy, and he will be able to find you the bizarre car of your dreams. This podcast is also brought to you by Vital Oxide. I am now gesturing to the bottle gloriously and seductively if you're watching on YouTube. It's a very powerful, heavy-duty odor eliminator. It doesn't just eliminate the odors, it destroys them entirely. Um, it's a surface disinfectant. It kills viruses like COVID-19. Uh, it eliminates mold and mildew up for up to four weeks. Uh, and there's no fragrance added, which is always fantastic because I don't like that fake piney smell. So. Vital Oxide. Check it out, listeners. I'm happy to welcome my old friend and shipmate, Mark Cho, clothing mogul, uh, master of the armory, the rake, and author of... Not the rake, mate. Drake. I mean, Drake. Ah! <laughs> Author, he owns H&M, uh, <laughs> Topshop, um, also men's magazines. I don't want anything to do with Topshop. That guy got busted big time for diddling models. You remember that? What? He did? Yeah, Philip Green. I didn't, he got oh, stripped yeah, of his knighthood. Oh, that, but he was, was that what he was doing? Well, he was doing plenty of terrible things. Okay, well, let me okay, let me restart. I rarely do terrible things. Let, well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only on Thursdays. Oh, all right, let me, let me, let me restart. Um, I don't know why I always get those two confused. The Armory, uh, Drake's, and also author of amazing, catchy YouTube titles like <laughs> What is the Correct Length for a Tailor Jacket? Um, <laughs> is this beige too beige? <laughs> How many pleats is too many pleats? Uh, so uh, <laughs> I, I love the titles of your YouTube videos, man. It's kind, they're, they're almost like um, they are so kind of beautifully boring in the best possible way they're not trying to be zesty they're not trying to be funny they're just these <laughs> incredible but they're also they're also incredibly kind of like what you know what's interesting is because i'm not uh well first of all i'm just say this man every time we meet i always feel a slight sense of shame because i'm just like a fucking i'm such a i'm not really very stylish when i sit next to you i'm like oh fuck i look like i'm in a frat house well i hope i don't make you you do. I try I blame not you to. You, uh, you, I try not. That's to. bullshit, man. I try not to. You, you. <laughs> I save my shittiest stuff. For when I'm no, man. But it, <laughs> it's <laughs> thanks, a you, thanks a lot, man. But you. But it's. And we're gonna um, end the episode right there. On that, yeah. like, that's an amazing diss. All right. Like we just we're out. And thank, thank you, Mark. Yeah, and thank you. That was. <laughs> And also, you know what I like is you are in the in your videos and and your stuff that you do for the Armory. You are the world's nicest man. Like, I think you've actually won that international award three years in a row. Am I, am I right? Or is it four years in a row? World's nicest man. Yeah, they give it to me in Sweden. You've um, won they're the, very pleasant in Sweden. You've won and, the golden uh, pleat yeah. four years in a row. That's, it's not even a pleat. You know, they're so pleasant. It's just this pebble. Yeah. And, and they're completely unoffensive with no sharp edges to it whatsoever. But it's, then when we have dinners, you have this like full like black beard pirate sense of humor that comes out. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> As I suspected. Mm -hmm. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about 
the fascinating origin story of Mark Cho. Rags to riches. You were a street urchin in Hong Kong. You were making. You were selling. You were selling pleated trousers on a handcart. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what I did. Yeah, you know, I would just collect scraps of cloth in the street, and uh, eventually I assembled clothing out of it. And then, but were you always bing, like, bam, boom? Uh, I have two stores in New York. That's <laughs> but were you, <laughs> were you always were you always like a were you always sort of fascinated with clothes and yeah, and... clothes are awesome. Clothes are super fascinating. Actually, tailored clothing is particularly fascinating. That's really my kind of thing. I really like tailored right. clothing, and I love kind of the technical aspects of it. You know, like how it's put together. I love the cultural aspects of it because you know, like. Clothing, like tailored clothing from different parts of the world, actually has kind of different flavors. And a lot of what we do at the Armory is helping people like discern those different types of flavors and figuring out what. Okay, would be so most hang on. For this, them. Is, this is okay. So this is kind of interesting. So, what's like a Hong Kong flavor versus, say, an English flavor versus, say, an Italian flavor? What are those? Um, okay, so what's interesting about Hong Kong tailoring uh, over the course of, say, like the last hundred odd years? I wrote an article about this. Okay, like, <laughs> and did it have? And a, believe did, me, and, and the then, article uh, was rejected for being too boring, <laughs> so I had to rewrite. Which it. is a high bar for you. I know it's a high bar. And did you. it have a fascinating title? Um, was no, it called? No, I just wrote Mark's boring essay number forty-three. See, why would they reject that? I don't know. So, okay, well, why don't you why don't you boil down the Hong Kong <laughs> the, the the rejected Hong Kong tailoring? Yeah, the Hong Kong tailoring thing um, originated. Uh, through China and actually originated through a city called Ningbo, which was like one of the poorest cities in China. Um, and <clears throat> somehow or other, those guys, this would have been like 1800s, 1900s, those guys got into uh, creating tailored garments for uh, colonials living in China. And so they were typically learning from English or Russian tailors who had little outposts uh, in the country. Uh, and then, you know, over time, like they got better and better at it. They opened their own schools. Um, and Japan, actually, at the same time, was kind of coming up in, in terms of tailoring. And all that tailoring was basically very English. Um, so, you know, is it, so is it safe to does, – so is Hong Kong particularly English or has it sort of become its own thing? Hong Kong originally was particularly English. Well, um, I know, no, but I mean in, just in terms of tailoring, did they, did they sort of branch out from that very traditional – So what happened was Hong Kong's tailoring – because Hong Kong was a fishing village, right? And it wasn't until um, – Everyone who wasn't Chinese got kicked out of China, and they all kind of resettled in Hong Kong. That tailoring became a thing in Hong Kong, uh, and so all of those Ningbo tailors, who end up being called Shanghainese tailors, and that's kind of the more kind of popular, well-known type of Chinese tailor, they carried British tailoring lineage down with them to Hong Kong. And so, like Hong Kong was a British tailoring-based kind of culture. Okay, well, so let me ask you this then. For instance, take a suit jacket. Mm -hmm. Would there be a stylistic thing for a Hong Kong suit jacket versus that you could tell v the difference between like an Italian one and an English one? Like, would it say have like? Loose yeah, they're they're like little little things. Um, British tailoring tends to have what's called drape, so it's a little bit fuller in the chest, has a lot more shape. Uh, it's got quite strong nipped waists. Uh, but Strong then, what? Sorry? Like the waist is nipped. It's okay. got an hourglass shape. Did you say nip to waist? Nipped waists. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yes. I, one of the things I really love about any kind of like subculture is the discovery of the vernacular. Mm -hmm. And like that's why I kind of love your <laughs> YouTube titles, man. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. they all have like – it's a whole like nipped waist. I mean I'm sure there's a whole lexicon of stuff. You know, like when you talk to car people or watch people, there's a whole like horological dictionary that if you're not a watch nerd, you just it makes no sense to you. You know, speaking of like um, very esoteric lexicon, English shoemaking actually has a lot of words that you've, I've been in this world for a long time. There were terms that I didn't even know until I met the other day this guy named Simon Balzoni who uh, used to take care of Foster and Son. It doesn't sound very English with Bolzoni. I know, but he's very English. Anyway, okay. so he used to take care of Foster and Son, and then now he's taking care of this um, bespoke brand called Henry Maxwell. They make great shoes. And he was like, oh, yeah, we're doing, making a lot of side springs. I was like, what the hell is a side spring? So a side spring is a lazy man. Do you know what a lazy man is? <laughs> no. What's so a lazy man is a flow chart. This is like a flow A lazy man is a derivation of a Cambridge. Do you know what a Cambridge is? No. <laughs> See, I didn't know half of these things. I only knew, knew what a lazy man was. So a lazy man is what... Winston Churchill used to wear. So Winston Churchill used to wear these shoes that looked like lace-ups, but they had elasticated sides so you can just slip your foot in and out. So, and they, had had so they, had protect, they had pretend laces there? Yes. You can make them with you pretend laces or you can leave you, them completely blank. I, you know what I really have come to admire about Winston Churchill? He's all about convenience because he wore the jumpsuit 
And then he had. Now I discover he wore like the slip-on shoes that looked like real shoes, but were not real shoes. I don't see the convenience of a jumpsuit. I still don't understand that. You're trying to talk me into this for ages. I don't understand. Okay, this. I'm just going to explain this. It's really simple, man. You put you for the jumpsuit. So, how many articles of clothing do you have to wear normally? Like right now, you're wearing a suit, jacket, a suit, and then a shirt. I guess then... I got a shirt, a jacket, pants, socks, and shoes. Okay, so for the jumpsuit, you put on underpants if you have to. I mean, you don't, that's not obligatory, mm -hmm. although there can be some awkward scraping with the zipper si situation. Mm, some and leakage, the, prone to leakage for certain people. <laughs> a certain age. Yeah. Be, my wife is talking about that as a, pro, as a possible product idea. You have, okay. Wait, 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 jump wait, oh, Do you mean nappies? Have, nappies have been around for a while. No, but you, <laughs> have you ever had a pee and then you stand up and there's a little dot oh, <laughs> like, my God. on your trousers, <laughs> the urine? You, that's never happened to you? No, no, it's never happened to me ever. <sighs> I'm kidding. Of course it happens. Okay, women. So she, women, women. <laughs> so she was talking about this idea of tra underpants that have like an absorbed, absorbing, absorptive panel in the front. Well, I mean, how much pee it, is leaking out? Well, just one dot is all it takes, man. To no, have it takes a lot more than one dot. To have on your trousers, You man. sound like you have like a shot glass coming out. <laughs> and that's how much is <laughs> left over. Ejected. <laughs> all right. Anyway, so you've got the underpants and then you could put on a shirt or not. And then that's it. And you put on the jumpsuit and you're instantly, at least in my mind, and in the perception from other people may be different. But when you're wearing a jumpsuit, you're immediately stylish, slightly eccentric and a man of your own destiny. Mm. <laughs> so you're eliminating choice. Yeah, you don't have to make, you don't have to choose like, oh, does this jacket go with these trousers? Is this pattern clash? Like it's, it's like, it's sort of grown up. Um, pajamas but that you wear outdoors but you can wear a suit for the same reason yeah but you then have you've one got an additional piece of clothing but then That's you've it. got a shirt and then you have to think about a tie and, and then maybe pants, braces yeah. and right. a belt you gotta, belt. You gotta match the belt cufflinks you've got all these other micro decisions to make i don't know i don't think it's as fussy as that is it not yeah. but, but then me, you know, i'm not even wearing a belt today because i forgot <laughs> that's because you're a pirate man you're I'm living on the edge joe i have my i have my little um I have my face mask and also my eye patch for the Uber. <laughs> Mark asked me if he could smoke in the studio. And oh, I, had to, I'm I had to explain sure. to him that it was America. <laughs> I'm sure I'll get the rental deposit back on this space. <laughs> totally fine. Can we do shots and smoke? So wait, so um, where did you start? Oh, yeah, that was the question. That huh? was the question. Yeah, yeah. Like the um, so I started, uh, I grew up in the UK, loved tailoring. I did a bunch of other stuff. And I got to this point in my life where I really wanted to pursue my love for being a merchant and dealing with clothing. And so I started in Hong Kong. I opened up the shop with some friends, uh, Alan C being my co-founder, called The Armory. And uh, the shop did pretty well. And we kind of expanded to another shop. And then after a while, I was like, oh, man, it'd be cool to have like something in another country. And then we just ended up with New York. And then New York went pretty well. And we have two in New York now as well. But that's that's like the very abridged version. But that's, I mean, that's a very cool orange, origin story in terms of like you start there and then your next stop is just New York. Yeah, because we were shipping stuff online, and so New York was like our number one export destination. Plus, you know, like Hong Kong's a finance center, so a lot right. of the people who shop with us in Hong Kong were New Yorkers, were New Yorkers anyways. Right, they're just there on business getting a suit done while they're there. Yeah, exactly. But let me ask you this, man. Yeah. The whole style thing, like I knew as a kid, I was always making art, I was taking pictures, so it was, it was natural that I'd become a photographer. Mm. So were you like an exceptionally well-dressed 11 year old like we wearing you know bow ties and top I was hats an exceptionally <laughs> dorky 11 year old like, I think that's so, a little more okay so accurate. what's the first so what's the first memory that you what you can identify where you go oh you know what I like clothing uh I bought this blue my sister bought me this blue blazer and uh I would, I would wear it all the time I was like oh this is great so how old were you when you when that I was like 16 Okay. Because we, you know, I went to school in the UK and you have uniforms, right? And when you're 16, you can Where stop. did you school, Joe? Uh, St. Paul's. Did you go to St. Paul's? Yeah. That makes sense. Oh, Wait, were you Westminster? I almost went to, I went to Westminster under school and then I went to Marlborough College. Oh, makes sense also. <laughs> None of this means anything. Yeah, if, no, if, 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 our if, US if, audience has no idea what you're talking about. Basically, if you, if you if, want to talk about the nerdiest schools in the UK, I went to the nerdiest schools. Yes, yeah, St. Okay. Paul's is super, is weapons-grade nerdy. But also, what you just witnessed 
is like if you've grown up in England or you spend a lot of time in England, when you English people meet each other, there's all this kind of sniffing that happens that that, that, in, that involves deciphering exactly who that person is, what kind of socioeconomic <laughs> background they're oh, from. Oh, like and, how many steps removed from the throne. Yeah. <laughs> are they in line for the throne? Should, are they worth marrying to increase your family's fortunes? All that kind of stuff all happens instantly when you meet English people, people who spend a lot of time in England. I try not to meet too many. That's yeah, fair. They're very odious. <laughs> Irksome. <laughs> of which you are very representative. Yeah, I'm very rep- I'm peak representation of that. <laughs> so, and then you and I met, um, we just had like one of those sort of, we were talking about this the other night at dinner. Like we had the one, that, we had sort of an instant uh, comedy friendship on Instagram, mm-hmm. which is unusual. I mean, you must. Yeah. I love it. I'm so happy we met. No, I know. Same here, man. But People I, seem to think when I'm talking shit about you, I somehow hate you, which is like so far from the truth. No, that's, <laughs> the fact that I'm that's, sitting here already means I don't hate you. That's well, the New York thing, though. Like if you're talking shit and making fun of somebody, you like them. But that's also, that's also a very, that's a very English thing. Like Exceptionally, I, yes. Yeah, like I, if you, Taking uh, the piss. Yeah, mm-hmm. if, you're not, if you're not making fun of someone, it means you don't like them. Yeah. And, but people particularly, well, especially here, people often misunderstand that. What kind of shit are you talking about? What Me. You what? When you said you were talking shit about. <laughs> well, I mean, you like there was that. Bit Wait a minute. In, it was that bit in Waco's video where I was like, oh, that, oh yeah, the movement thing. Right. And right. you were like, oh, my God, people got so mad about that. Well, OK, like, well, let's explain. So um, Mark's on a was doing a video in, in, in interviewing Waco, who's, who's this, who has a magazine called The Revolution, Revolution and, a, and a bunch of other things. And, and The Rake. Yeah. And The Rake, which I and. Uh, and at one point, well, you, we, why don't you tell us? You tell the story. I'm not going to paraphrase. There's not much to the story. It's I did amazing. this interview. We were talking about people we like, and I mentioned Phil. And I was like, yeah, Phil has great taste, but he's one of these people who has great taste in such a way that he really, he's aesthetically very intelligent, but he actually doesn't know that much about what's going on inside. And usually you Are don't- we talking about in the, in the context of watches? In, in the context of watches, yeah. And <laughs> usually you never get to this level of aesthetic sophistication without having quite a deep understanding also of what goes on inside. Right. Like he skipped like 10 years of schooling. Like I'm, I'm like an idiot savant, basically. Like I, I know I like pretty things, but I have no idea what they do or how they work. But you guys connected over watches. Yeah, that's the bond, don't you think? We just like talking shit to each other. I think that's, that's right. where we. I really think we connect connected. over abuse. Yes, that's yes. right. As survivors of friendly abuse, you know, that's how we connected. That's right. So, are you afflicted with the same watch collecting disease as Phil, or is it mostly yeah, a little bit, a little bit? Okay, I would say, but you, but your watch collect, I. <laughs> You know, I think actually being friends is unhealthy for me because I, <laughs> I'm just coming to this realization now, Cho, because your level of watch, uh, watch collecting, first of all, it is kind of like super old geezery. It is very geezery. It's yeah. really geezery, but it's also very sophisticated. But you, oh, you, you but yeah, but you like, like, like I was actually surprised that you like the watch I'm wearing today. That I you love managed that to thing, fix. man. It's amazing. Yeah. And what, and this is what I mean by what being is a this watch for the audience, just so this is a Omega Seamaster Tulip. It's black tulip. It's called, which is they made in the in I think eighty two for they made a few hundred. They weren't. Uh, they, they, it's a ceramic watch. It's a quartz watch. But I just find it. I don't know. I just kind of like it. I love how it looks. I think it's amazing, man. I think it really suits you, and I think it really suits your whole collection too. Well, because not that many people are that smart about how to put together a collection. Well, so how? Okay, well. Let's talk about me for a minute and how great. Please, sure. Let's talk about how great I am for a minute. Let's do it. <laughs> Enough about you, Mark. Let's just turn this <laughs> around and you would interview me. Okay, well, uh, interesting. I'm just curious as to why does this fit my collection out of interest? Because you have, you have like four major silos in your collection, all of which suit your personality, right? So you have the um, old, Rone- old Rolex chrono section, of which mm-hmm. you have a few. Uh, and then you have the 70s Pateks, typically with blue dials or with kind of spacey futurism type designs, oftentimes like they were Japan specials as well. And then you have like the real like obscure futury stuff from like Ikepod or that Omega you're wearing or that other Omega with the, oh man, like that the hybrid res- case. The, the rece- oh, the, oh the, um, the Polaris, the Seamaster Polaris. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. So how come you, do, are you interested in any of the court stuff from the 80s or that's not? You? I like it. I mean, I, for me, I was all about the, the Royal love- Oak 34 millimeters in quartz. Right. Yeah. But then they got really expensive. I was like, eh, whatever. But you've been, you're, aren't you kind of a, a movement geezer? I like them, but I'm not, 
It's hard to say. It, sometimes I like them. Sometimes they don't bother me. You know, I buy watches with like just whatever movements, but I also buy watches because of the movement, right? I've been on both sides of that. Yeah, thing. you see, I've never done that. I, I, I mean, I, I've, and it's funny. I just don't have interest in like the mechanical. And it's the same for cars. Like I've never really cared about what's in it. I just care about how it looks. And, and also I like the history of things. Mm. I like really unusual history of things. Mm. And I also, at least in cars, I love things that have been neglected or overlooked, or I love things that have been maligned in some way. Mm. The underdogs. I know what you yeah. mean. Yeah. Well, I think also because you're aesthetically smart about these things, you understand the lineage. And when you understand the lineage, it makes you a lot more sensitive to like, even though everyone else thinks this thing sucks, like because you understand the lineage, you actually understand why the designers end up with this sucky quote unquote design. But if you right. look at it from a slightly different perspective and in a slightly different context, it's actually kind of genius too. Well, that, that's interesting because that makes me think about another sort of interest of mine. And, and I think this exists in horology a little bit, This, this that, that old things often acquire mythology, but they equally acquire um, old uh, false mythology. Mm. You know, particularly with cars, there are certain cars that I've sort of made a, a bit of a career out of buying cars that have been become obscured by this fog of of unreal a fake verbiage right like mm. there's there's stories about these cars like the shamal or the xj220 but there's and people sort of repeat this law for decades and and do you think that happens i mean in some ways i think the quartz watches as a whole have a little bit like that like there's there's this sort of horological habit that's been hung over this that's been around for 20 or 30 years of people dismissing quartz mm. because that's just what everyone does mm. but it's do you do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, you have F. P. Jean who's done a the the yeah elegance, whatever it's called. What's mm. it called? Ele I think elegant. Do you pronounce it elegante or elegant? It's I French, so I probably elegant. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But if you always go elegante, <laughs> I always want to just go, hey, hey you have an elegante. <laughs> but do you, don't you do you feel there's other sort of things that are in the watch world that are sort of obscured by that that kind of false mythology? Or just I don't know about false mythology. I think sometimes the mythology kind of blinds you to the watch a little bit. Right. right. Like the Speedmaster is cool. Don't get me wrong. But I, I don't go as crazy for it. And some people are obsessed with it. Well, you know? yeah, but I feel like you're not – you part, part of the reason you wouldn't like that is because it's it, – I, I think you are a little bit like me in the sense that you, you like obscurity. I mean you want, you want to be wearing something you don't see a lot of people wearing. I suspect. Yeah. yeah, I think that's part of it. I think that's part of it. It's like a, it's a weird form of collecting snobbery. But, mm. um, but, but I find that fascinating because it's so ingrained in me, this idea that I don't want to wear something that other people have. Um, and I'm always surprised to see other people happily wearing what other people have. Mm. You know what I mean? No. I do know what you mean. You know why? Because I, I sometimes think like, oh, you know, the army is very esoteric, very niche, right? So there's like a tiny little group of people get us and then everyone else is like, what the hell's wrong with these people? And that's kind of okay, our well, world. <clears throat> and I've always wondered, what would it be like to work on a product that was actually appealing to a very large audience all at the same time? Like white Converse are, are, is an example of that. Right. You know, a lot of different people can wear white Converse. So it could be really interesting to work on a product like that. So why do you think that what's, what makes the armory so niche? Like, what is it about it? Because we're a bit boring and we're very long-winded and most people don't have patience for us. But if you're willing to put the time in, you'll probably find out there's some pretty interesting things underneath it all. Well, it's interesting because I, I know I sort of mocked you a bit for it's like nerdcore, mm -hmm. right? But it's true that the that it's easy. Like, look, I'm, I'm not... I, I, I don't pay much attention, even though I, I'm interested in style. And, and, and it's so interesting. Like, I would really like to, every time I see you, you're always exceptionally well-dressed. And I, I know That's every right. time I see that, I think, fuck, I would really like to, I wish I could really put effort into, because when I do make an effort, I feel I really like it. Mm. Like, I like how it makes me feel. But so, you know, it's easy to look at the stuff and sort of, and go, oh, it's, as you say, it's a little bit boring. But then the more I see what you make, the more I kind of begin to understand, like the, it's, there's kind of joy in the uh, a hardcore nerdery of it all. Yeah. Are you wearing the armory right now? Yeah. And this is our armory model six double, no, no, model 16 double breasted. And this is a shirt a friend of mine gave me as a gift. Nice. So can you like, so, okay. So this, so this, like the suit, this is a suit. It's not mm -hmm. like a, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a 50, 50 wool cotton mix in a really deep twill. 
got a little bit of stretch to it. It's nice for the summer. You know, <laughs> you wear it with sneakers, which I like. But this I, is like this is like a standard like popular item for you guys. Uh, no, not necessarily. I, I, I just like, like it. I feel like you should have a. There should be like a sex line, telephone line that you should run, where people could call up and you go, "I'm wearing a fifty fifty uh, deep <laughs> deep twill double breasted with some stretch to it." Like this, <laughs> like the way you talk about it, man. It's really, it's it's. I don't people know. seem to like it. I'm listen. I'm I'm glad people like it. But it, I had a friend of mine who was like. You know, we always put you on YouTube every night to put our daughter to sleep. Because it's like, very... Wow, it's great. <laughs> because, Glad I was of use. Excellent. Because it's really soothing. Like, there's almost this ASMR quality <laughs> to when I watch your videos of you. So, you know, well, I'm going on today, the deep twill with a, <laughs> with a 20, 30 viscose blend. And I don't even know if that's a thing, but probably. Is, yeah. probably. Okay. Yeah. So, so you have a very... I mean, what's also interesting about the armory is you have a very... You're kind of... The watch thing is important, so you do these extraordinary kind of collaborations. Which uh, I yeah, I I mean I've been collecting for such a long time, and finally I was like, oh, it'd be fun to make some stuff with people if they're open to it. And luckily, some people were open to it, and double lucky that the things we made uh, people liked, and we managed to sell them. Um, well, it wasn't okay. It wasn't. I mean, I know you, you're being all humble when you talk about luck, but you happen to. There's two things happening. One is you're picking really interesting, accomplished people to work with, and two is mm. you guys have good taste and good ideas, so you can sort of, you know, that that both of those things help to make something people want. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you're completely right. It's really about like meeting a lot of the right people along the way, you know, and it, it's the sort of. Like, I couldn't have met these people earlier in my career, earlier in my life. You know, you kind of need a track record, and then everything you do builds on your existing track record, and more and more doors open, and and somehow, sooner or later, you end up with some limited edition watches that are half designed by you. I mean, look, cool. you, you, I mean, you, you've worked with extraordinary F.P. Jean. Yeah, I've got mine right here. Yeah, which is just crazy and amazing. Ooh. Admire it. Ooh. <laughs> Love it. Touch it. This actually, uh, this is... This is beautiful. Thanks. It's all right. I just did the colors on it. It's got nice weight too. Yeah. These were the last. Does the back does the, the back fall off? The like back mine? did not fall no, off. No, I my snapped hands. it in with my own bare fingers. <laughs> <laughs> no. I suppose you your clothed fingers. So how so many you, units would that be? Well, this we made five of those. Um, this was done more as a favor to me than anything else. Uh, these are the last five 38 millimeter platinum resonances uh, that FP Jour never made. And then um, I asked for them. That should mean a lot of things to you. <laughs> well, I mean, I heard platinum, which explains the weight feeling in my hand. But, you know. Yeah, well, joints are, are heavy, not just because platinum, because but also because the movements are gold as well. Oh, wow. Mm. I didn't cool. know that. Yeah. But anyway, you've worked with F.P. Jean, you've worked with Moser. Yeah, the Moser uh, one was great. That was fun. I like that. What's the Moser one? Um, I don't have one here, but... but we'll it's, just... it, the dial is Vanta Black? Yeah, so uh, we made this collaboration watch with a company called H. Moser, um, which is kind of a Swiss independent. They do really good work. And they're one of the things that they're really good at is working with this material called Vanta Black. So Vanta Black stands for Vertically Aligned Nanotube Array. And it's the blackest material in the world. Um, what How it works is that the nanotubes are vertically aligned. They're like this kind of honeycomb grid of nanotubes. And when the light hits the nanotube, it goes down to the tube, bounces around, and never comes back out. You know, and you see things <laughs> like because light career. is reflecting back into your... Right. <laughs> it's like my career. It goes down the tubes, bounces around, never comes back out. What no, do you mean? Absorbed. You have a podcast now. Look at Phil. us now. You're peak Phil. You're Eat, reaching peak Phil. Look at Phil, us eating man. chicken rinds in a small room <laughs> in an Alice room. No, but, okay, so basically it absorbs the light. So it, it doesn't reflect light. it back to you. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And so Moser's really good at working with that material. And then we just kind of brought some new design ideas to them on like how you could create a new watch design out of that. Because typically the Moser Vanta Black watches were very minimal. And we were like, oh, but you know, the other interesting thing about having something that's that black is when you put stuff around the black, it, it kind of is a lot stronger. Mm -hmm. And so we took this, the idea of a total eclipse. Like a total eclipse is interesting. A solar total eclipse is really interesting because when you look at the sun, it's the only time you can see the halo around the sun. Normally the sun's too bright and so you don't see the halo. And so we recreated that kind of halo effect using a ring of red gold around the um, Vanta Black. And then we also wanted to add a little bit of detail onto the black. But the thing is, Vanta Black is super, super, super fragile. Like, you cannot touch it. If you touch it, you wreck it. So um, we kind of devised this way where we could create little holes in the Vanta Black that look down onto little pieces of gold. And that created these little hour markers as well. 
it was a, it was a cool design. I was really happy how it turned out. And we did that over email. I think so. I'm I'm really glad it worked out. It's amazing. I mean, every time you look at the watch, your soul disappears into the Vanta Black. It goes down, the tubes rattles around, and never comes back out. It's an added bonus. Well, well, but it's, but well. it's really beautiful. And it's, God, it's one of those things where I find it irritating sometimes. I'm so stuck in, in my own particular way of seeing that I looked at that watch. I was like, oh, yeah, this is kind of beautiful. And then, but I didn't put my hat in to get one. And then after, I thought, fuck, I'm stupid. I didn't get one. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you also collaborated with someone who I really love, um, Naoya Hida. Naoya Hida. Yeah, um, that's right. And one, he's a Japanese watchmaker. One of the things I really love about him is I, I am, I'm like this grumpy old geezer leaning out the window, yelling at kids to turn <laughs> down and rock and roll. Because I find that most, a lot of independent watch brands, and we've talked about this, mm. Um, it seems like we're in this sort of Baroque Rococo period of independent <laughs> watch brand design where it's just a shitload it's, it's all like triple you know dozens of little dials floating above a skeletonized dial and then it plays the music from the Godfather and then kicks you in the nuts <laughs> on the hour or you know they just they just do all this stuff and, and the thing I love about Hida is it's a it's the idea of an, a watch from the 50s or the 40s or the ish but it's but it's trickled through his own brain and come out as a version of that that's different enough yet familiar enough. And it's incredibly simple and really beautiful. And then, of course, you explained to me all these details, which me as the village idiot had not noticed, <laughs> like the super, the super thick dials and stuff. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's taking a vintage aesthetic, but he's creating it using some modern techniques as well. He's blending a lot of things. You right. know, it's like fusion cuisine. It's it's really interesting because of all the different things he blends. And if you know how watches are put together, the more you know, the more like, oh, wow, never never thought of putting that stuff together this way before. And then you guys did a collaboration where you did that. You designed your own typeface, which really is just, un it's, I'm, as an ex-art director, I really obsess over typography and watches because I feel like most Oddly, and it's so weird that most watch brands don't seem to pay any attention to typography. I'm, I, it's shocking to me. You, although you know who does is Hermes. Mm, yes, the Hermes typography is wonderful. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, it's but, so good. But you guys designed a typeface for that for that Hida watch. I really yeah. the letter cutter. Yeah, so we call yeah. that font the letter cutter um, because Hida's watch dials are hand engraved. And if you're going to engrave something, you, you actually shouldn't use thin lines. You should use relatively thick shapes. Uh, and so we created a font that was kind of based on Art Deco typefaces, but also would make the most of the engraver's skill. Hmm. Yeah. I wish I had one to show you. Well, I also well, wish we had video. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we can, we well, yeah, there'll be inserts for okay. the people that want to watch this on YouTube. Okay, cool. So that's – so, and then you're doing um, – you're doing well. It's interesting. Well, you're doing a watch now. You said you wanted to do something a bit more mass now, right? Or well, can you talk about that? Is that all no, top secret? No, I can't talk about that. Okay. That's still top no, secret. No, Phil. I told you before. Yeah, I I do want to make something that's like you know one to three thousand US dollars. Um, it's taking a little while, but I think it'll be good when it's done. I hope it gets done. We'll see. I'm amazed at how because you know I've fallen down that watch designing rabbit hole myself because mm -hmm. I'm in the middle of trying and you've seen the thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm and I love to, it. I think it's amazing. Well, uh, <laughs> thank you, man. That's very nice of you to say. Uh, but it is it is surprising how long everything takes, and also it, you're kind of designing on a. Well, I've never designed a watch before, but the, but the it's so micro in terms of the, how specific you specifically have to focus on the details in a way mm -hmm. I've never had to think about before. Like like you said, you know, like have you thought about when the strap, the bracelet is at this angle, how the watch case is going to look? All these kind of things that yeah. I've never considered before, which is kind of fascinating. Yeah, I guess because previously you probably didn't work in three dimensions as much, right? Like, cause it's very sculptural. When you're working well, on watches. I've, I've done, uh, as an artist, I've done a bunch of sculptural things. And oh, that's true. I'm sorry. Three How dare you? Get out, Joe. <laughs> get out. I'm putting why my headphones not, down now. I'm why leaving. do you not know my entire oeuvre? <laughs> Anytime you can get oeuvre into the conversation. <laughs> yeah, but those, but those, but not on the level of detail that's required for watches and all that kind of thing. So it's been pretty fascinating. Um, and also, I'm working with a chap, um, Alfred, in Hong Kong. Hello, Alfred. Hi, Alfred. Uh, <laughs> who, who, well, he, he really knows what he's doing. So, and it's, it's actually been very interesting because he, he said to me that it's, it was been refreshing work with me because I don't know, I don't know what you can't do. Hmm. So, so I just suggest things. And a lot of things I suggest are just stupid. 
because you can't do them. But then some of those things are just things that may work, but they're just interesting because I'm not from that background. Which I think is wonderful. And I think it's a real, a, a needed breath of fresh air in watch design. Do you think you'd like to make your own brand of watches, just not do a collaboration at some point? If I got better at it, maybe. I don't think we're good enough yet. Really? Yeah. What makes you say that, man? I mean, you've had very you've had such good success in all the watches you've done. Yeah, but I mean, it's because you know we had like great people working with us. You know, I I think it's it's a little premature. You know, there's still so much more to learn. Is that I, th I thought? I mean, I know everything. I could. Do, you want me to help you out, man? <laughs> as, 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 as the village idiot. But wait, are you actually designing a watch from scratch? Yeah, we're. I'm this doing... is not like the modified like Rolex thing with the engraving. No, this no, is... no. This is a whole from scratch, totally new design. Um, inspired really by my love of two things of, of the Rolex of the 70s kind of integrated bracelet watches the Rolex Midas I guess three things and then brutalist architecture so they're all kind of blending into this one uh, design and and I guess the good thing is as far as I can tell no one's really doing anything like it and the bad thing is no one is doing anything like it so it's one of those things where you know either it's going to be I think a kind of a binary proposition for that kind of thing concrete bracelet <laughs> yeah, that's right. Concrete bracelet. Yeah. It actually it, has that vibe to it. Yeah, oh, it's great. Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Well, Mark's seen a he's seen like a three D printout version, and we were trying to saw it apart at your dining room table as well. <laughs> that's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. But you know, like, I think because you're an art director, you can magic something out of nothing. I struggle with that. I can edit things that exist and you know put my own spin on it. But for me to come up with something from zero would I would struggle with that. But you know all the right people that you could. I, you know what? I think you've got enough of imagination, Matt. You don't think so? No. Would you do a sport watch or a dress watch? It'd be a dress watch, right? No, I, I think it was um, something cheap. I would do a sport watch. You would? Yeah, you know not I, like a sport sport watch. You know what I'd love to do is like a cool digital watch. Yeah, that would be amazing. Like everyone was shitting on the, um, the GR Perico, um, you know, the one that looks like a hood. And it, it used to, it, it came out in like oh, the yeah, 70s yeah, yeah, yeah. and it had the but, red yeah, LEDs. But they reissued that. Yeah, What's they that? did. And what? people were complaining about it. But I thought it was beautiful. Wait, were people complaining about the reissue? Yeah. What were they saying? They're like, why is it so expensive? Well, what was it? It was pretty expensive. It was like five grand or something, four grand? I think so. But I mean, it was a really beautiful, very complicated case and bracelet. And right. the whole thing was obviously custom. They didn't like pull anything off the shelf for that. You do, have to, to you do have to love the way the internet complains. Remember we were talking about uh, when I was, you had done that video on Hida and then I had read all, I was reading all the comments. Oh, yeah. And they, people were just, it was, like this, it was like this piranha feeding frenzy, stripping the flesh off the horse in 2.3 seconds of people being <laughs> enraged because they were seeing like a 10x macro close-up and they could see sort of dust on the dial or something. Yeah. And people were mad about it. People were very angry. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I think I can, I don't think I can talk my way out of a situation like that because people are so incensed already. It's sort of pointless. So you just move on. Well, no, you can't. There's nothing you can do. To, you, there's nothing you can do to, to, you can't calm internet rage, really. <laughs> you know I mean? There's really, you're sorry you're going to have a reasoned discussion in, in, the, in the Instagram chat comments about, yeah. about, about, about like whatever it is you're trying to persuade people to believe. Actually, weirdly, once or twice, I have talked people off the edge on Instagram and on like our own channels. And they luckily we have like pretty reasonable viewers and followers and whatnot. So they're like, oh, okay, we get it. They well, might not agree, but they're like right. civilized about the whole thing, which well, is nice. Well, look, man, I mean, I, organizations ref always reflect the leader. So I, as you know, I, I can't imagine you're gonna have a bunch of crazy unhinged, you know, people <laughs> who are into acid wash jeans and then also shop at the armory. <laughs> well, you also have, so I'm very curious about this. You also yeah. have Drake's. Yes. Which so is Drake. not like Drake is the musician. It's not The Rake, which is a He magazine. owns Drake the musician. Oh, no. Congratulations yeah. on Champagne Poppy. He, he, <laughs> he genetically bred him in a lab. They released him a few years ago. He's, he's been doing very well. We're working out great. You yeah. know, my mother still still calls the company Drake. She's like, oh, how's your Drake doing? <laughs> <laughs> I like that it's singular. <laughs> How is the Drake? <laughs> it's become like a person. Bring um, me the Drake. No, I took over this old English. Um, it's not even actually that old. It was, it, was 19, it was started in 1977 by a guy named Michael Drake. And I took it over in 2010 because uh, I just really like neckties. And Michael Drake was kind of looking to get out of the business. And you know, grew it and we do other stuff now. We used to be just 
kind of neckties and accessories and now a total look. And we have some shops here and there. And uh, yeah, it's been good. And, and it's, it's like a different track from the army though. Like it's uh, like Drake's is, how is it called? Drake, buddy. The Drake. <laughs> Drake's is Show all me on the Drake. <laughs> Drake's is all about um, the vision of the head designer, Michael, Michael Hill. Okay. And Michael Hill was Michael Drake's right-hand man. And Michael Hill has like incredible taste. He's an incredible designer and I, I love working with him. Um, and because I love working with him, I don't mess with the product because the product is great, right? I basically just like make sure the company doesn't explode. So what makes him, a, what makes him a, an incredible designer? Uh, you know, this goes back to collections actually. Like you look at the collection and everything just fits together perfectly and hangs together perfectly. And even, and as a collection, the kind of the aura of all these products together just seems to be so coherent and it just makes so much sense, you know? And in the same way, like that's how I feel when I look at your collection. When I, even though these are all like disparate pieces from different eras and different styles, like you look at them all together and the sum is much greater than the parts. You know what's interesting about that kind of thing, man, is it's almost like a form of mental, it's like Tetris or Jenga. Like when you look at someone's collection, you look at a car, someone's car collection or a watch collection or their, or their clothing, mm. and, it, and it somehow cognitively sl everything slots into place mm. in a way that you can't articulate but mm. makes sense. Mm. You know what I mean? Like when I, I think that's a great metaphor for it, yeah. When I walk into, when I walk into the armories, <laughs> as your mother calls it, um, like it, it, there's that there's that kind of Jenga thing that happens where everything there's there's no wrong note in there. Oh, thanks, man. Well, um, yeah, but it's but, and I bet it's all reflexive, especially after all this time of doing it. It's not like I don't think you have, probably have to consider that. But that's what you're saying about this chap, Michael. Yeah, and I think. Michael is, you know, everything at Drake's is kind of singular. It's from Michael. Whereas like everything at the Armory is, it's a bit me, but it's a bit like other people on the team. And it's, it's more of a mishmash. Um, but fortunately, because all the individuals working together still kind of share a sensibility. So it still looks reasonably coherent, reasonably. What's the, what's kind of the vibe aesthetic of each of these? Um, we do a lot of tailoring. Okay. Uh, the last couple of years, we've moved into kind of more casual tailoring. So, you know, it's no longer navy and gray suits. We can do funny things like this, like 50-50 um, cotton wools. And, you know, we love tailoring. So we always want to create things that would be for people who love tailored clothing, right? So do you do stuff from scratch all the time or not? Uh, yeah, a lot of stuff of ours, of ours is from... Can, like, you do it, can you make me a jumpsuit? I would need to find a guy because it's, Cause it's you know, not easy to make a, a jumpsuit, you know? You know what the problem is? What? You don't want to get the yo-yo bulls. No. <laughs> what are the, is that like some form of camel toe? <laughs> yes, exactly. Because oh. with a jumpsuit, you have to have enough rise. Otherwise, you get like the full, like, you know. Maybe you need a, like, guillotine, a little guillotine. adjustable pouch down there. <laughs> but you also don't with want a winch? A, yes, with a, a winch. A little, little, like a little string. And you, eee, but you, you, don't, <laughs> you don't want diaper butt either. Cause yeah, but the, well, no, you're right. But you ha you'd rather have you'd rather have the baggy ass than the than the incised balls. Is that <laughs> for anyone? Mark, you just cocked your head at me when you heard that phrase. No, I mean, like we come across that from time to time. Like some people like really long rises because they don't like their pants to touch their balls. Oh, that's like, re that's reasonable. Yeah. 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 Oh. Hmm. Hmm. Well, when you get older, you like to have the trousers touch the balls. No, it's all you've got. <laughs> <laughs> so the I'd like to know you're still there. Yeah, so the, yeah that's so right. The, the I'm armory, still alive. <laughs> so the armory's vibe is very much like it's going to be tailored. Like you can pick it up off the rack, but it would be better if it, you tailored it's, it a little bit. It, well, everything we, almost everything we sell on the tailored side, we need to alter, mm -hmm. right? So even the sleeves are not finished. Like you can't just pick it up and, and walk out the store. Like we'll take care of you. We'll shorten the sleeves, lengthen the sleeves. We'll nip the waist, let out the waist, all that sort of stuff. Um, but then we also have like more and more casual wear, mm -hmm. uh, things like safari jackets. Um, we do these kind of like casual, almost like a blazer, not a blazer sort of thing, like shirt jackets. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of different styles of like casual shirts as well with different collars and different details. Um, and, you know, we, we do shoes as well. We do accessories as well. We do bags as well. Uh, and everything just kind of has our, our, t our handwriting on it. That's how, that's a Michael Hill phrase. Michael Hill loves saying, Handwriting, you know, he's like, a, this has to have the brand's handwriting, which I think is a nice phrase. It's interesting, man, because uh, as you know, I've started my own extraordinarily successful clothing line, <laughs> which is full of your handwriting it, everywhere. It's all down to the packing slips. It is. It's all. <laughs> it's all full of my handwriting, but it's just 
It's interesting to be, you know, I'm I'm at the very bottom of sort of Viva Bastardo, and 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 I'm. It's been such an extraordinary learning curve in terms of just le- again mm. going back to vernacular. Like when you start making clothing, or even when you're kind of half making clothing, there's a whole raft of words and linguistic stuff you have to learn in order to talk to the people making it, in order to understand what they're saying to you. But also the idea of just getting things made, figuring out how to get them made, figuring out figuring out what's quality, what's not. I mean, it's I find it really daunting. Uh, so it's you know you're clearly leagues and generations ahead of where I am now. But it's just kind of. It is fascinating to sort of see how you go about doing things. And uh, also, do you have, do you guys have um, other things? Do you design stuff yourself or not really still? Yeah, or, I still do. So um, if any, in fact, we just had a call this morning. Basically, there's like four of us, four main people on the creative team. So it's like me, my co-founder, Alan, my creative director here in New York, Jim, and then my buyer in Hong Kong, Jan. And... In theory, we're all meant to work together. In practice, everyone, it's like herding cats, right? Like everyone's just working on their own little thing. And then we try to have a call every once in a while to be like, hey, I'm working on this thing. And then we'll all like weigh in and tell, it's, tell them it's good or bad or whatever. So what does that mean when you say you're working on something? Like are you, are you, are you sitting around and you're on the plane like, oh, you know what? I want to I want to do some galoshes yeah, for this season. Basically, that is what it's like. Is it really? And yeah. so then what happens? Do you sketch stuff out? Yeah, sometimes you sketch stuff out. Sometimes you look for factories that do something similar and you go and talk to them. Can you draw? I draw terribly, but I can just about eke out a diagram. Okay. Yeah. Because I can't draw at all. Really? Not at all. I mean, when I was shooting for magazines on a regular basis, they'd often say, because I was doing a lot of conceptual photography, magazines would call me up and they say, we have this article. Can you illustrate this article with with an idea? So I think of an idea and and 99% of the time it was something that there was no reference material to say it's going to be like this because I, I wanted to do something original. So they'd say, can you do a sketch? And then I'd say, really... You don't want me to do a sketch because you're not going to understand what's happening. <laughs> or you will dislike the idea because the sketch is so bad. No, no, no. They, well, so then I would give them a sketch and then and then I <laughs> call them and go, so what do you think? And they go, okay, you know what? We don't know what's happening with this drawing because it was it was like, it's like a, it was, I don't even know. I can't even compare what this, it was just, yeah, it was incomprehensible. Well, you know, one of my favorite images of yours was like, because you posted ages ago, I was like, wow. You do that, Phil? Because it was brilliant. It was really beautiful. It was, oh god, it Thank was like you. models in this like in this gauze that was sort of tightly wrapped, but then oh, like yeah, anchored yeah. at a point. Oh, uh, yeah, was that, <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was um, it was this. I had one model, and I and she was wearing a body stocking. But then I kind of in Photoshop, I just sort of elongated and stretched and sort of made her into sort of a sculptural shapes and stuff. Uh, yeah, I and, mean, and it worked with the light too. That was the really genius right. part of it too. Yeah, well, it was kind of semi-translucent, but you couldn't see, you couldn't really see her body, which I liked. I mm. preferred that to keep that sort of obscured, but it it had this kind of ethereal quality to it. I mean, I, I do miss that actually. And it's like, how the hell would you sketch that? Well, that was an idea I did for myself. That was not for a magazine. So, okay. that, so but but I was always, as a photographer at least, I was always in, it was always interesting to me that the distance between the thing in my head and the reality was always very short. Mm. And it was, but, but it was a really, well, I don't know why I'm talking about myself, but it was, a very, it was a very binary proposition what I did doing this conceptual photography magazine. So it was either really good or totally shit. <laughs> 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 there, was, there was not much, you know, it's hard. There wasn't much middle ground like, oh, it's okay. It was, it was either a massive failure or just kind of worked out. Mm. Um, but enough about me. I don't, <laughs> unless you want to know more about me. Um, so that's it. Do we Thanks have to talk coming. about cars? You don't, you don't know anything about cars. Yeah, do you don't. Know about Actually, cars? do you have a car? No. You don't like cars? You, you, you see no use do, for do them? Do you have a bicycle? No. <laughs> Skateboard? Do you have an Uber account? Uber account? I do have an Uber account. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about It's Uber. got a good rating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very polite. Do you know anyone house. who's have a... Actually, what is your rating? What point? Eight something? You know, I've never checked my rating. Hang on a minute. I'm gonna take a look. Let's have a look. That's I've never. What do you know anyone who has a bad rating? I yeah, my I, wife has a bad rating. I've really? A, I'm like, four, what did you do? Four point seven nine. Wait, where do you? Uh, if you what? click on your profile. Profile. Let's see. Oh, four point seven five. <laughs> oh my god! What did you do? Oh. What do you have? Four point eight four. Oh. You're the low, you're the lowest score at the table. 
I feel like that's actually be an amazing thing. Like we should have dinners, and the person with lowest Uber rating has to pay for dinner. <laughs> oh, Does that, is that. that a real thing? That should be a thing. It should be a thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, why am I lowest? I'm always very polite. I make conversation. Maybe you shouldn't make conversation. <laughs> I think that's actually the. Do you think that is? I yeah. It's yeah. I make an awkward joke and then I like it, and then that's it. Yeah. Two stars. Like, why is this guy in the backseat just blathering on about watches and yeah. cars? And my that. cars. Why don't what he's saying? Just shut up. If you have a English. car, why are you in my car? Shut up, English guy. <laughs> God, I have an Uber story I have to tell you later. We can't tell it on air. Come we, on. No, we definitely you can't, can't tell it. Like, you can't, like, No, we definitely, no. What? Is gonna, this the time when you, it's this when you, it's torpedo. What? Is this when you, is this No, when, it, it's not, it's my friend's Uber story anyway. It's oh, not my Uber story. Oh, my friend. Uh-huh. My friend has a tiny <laughs> penis. How can he make it larger? <laughs> <laughs> is this the one where you went in with no pants? No, not that one. Okay. No, no. I did that once inadvertently. No, uh, well, it's actually, it's completely different. Is story. the punchline you were wearing a jumpsuit? No, the punchline. I, I was, I was in a foreign country. I can't remember where, and I had to be. I was on in a, at a photo festival. I was giving a lecture, and I had, and I had to. Be, I was being interviewed by a foreign journalist in another country. So I had to get up like five in the morning to do like a FaceTime video thing. So I put on a shirt, but I was, so, I was like, "Fuck it, I'm not going to wear trousers," you know. But then, so I was talking to her. And then I dropped something. And then I know it sounds like a Harvey Weinstein situation, but I dropped something. And I was like, oh, shit. Because I think I spilled something or something. And then I bent over. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I just mooned you. I'm really sorry. But it was totally, I mean, now you would get, you know, that it was completely inadvertent. I, I did. I was just like semi-conscious. And anyway. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Come on. Tell us about this. Tell us about the story of your friend with this tiny penis. Come on. Your friend. No. Let's oh, move on. All right, fine. <laughs> You've changed, Cho. So here's, a, here's another question for you. If you want to, if Phil wanted to kind of change up his style a little bit. I actually said this to you the other day, I, and, you, and then I got too lazy to come over. Like, what would Thanks. you, what would you, <laughs> but what would you recommend for someone like Phil? Nothing. Do you think, okay, can I ask you this? Do you think this shirt's a crime against society? No, I like it. Oh. Yeah. All right, fine. Fine then. Yeah, the... let's end the podcast right now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. <laughs> I mean, much as my temptation is to talk shit about Phil, like I have to put on my professional hat, and I like the shirt Phil's wearing. And the whole point of what we do is we need to figure out things that work for this person. Mm-hmm. I like that shirt on Phil. I think it's very right for Phil. So we need to just find things that go with that. Like you know, what? and the, and ideally, we should be finding things that don't work for other people. They just work for Phil. You know, it's just about decoding people and decoding their style and. At, at the end of the day, the clothes need to represent you, mm-hmm. right? Okay, like, so give me a – can you throw out a couple of examples of what makes sense to people if you're going to give me some kit to wear? Um, I think Top for you, hat. like, very rumpled things would look great on you, right? Like heavy linens, especially, like, black linens on you I think would look great with your hair oh, as well. That's a good idea. Yeah. Monocle? Uh, yeah, maybe we put some spikes around the edge of the monocle. Give <laughs> it a little would, bit of a Mad Max I vibe. I don't understand how people keep the monocle in. I think just have squint you ever, a lot. Yeah, squinting a lot. Have you, have you ever tried one? No. Are I, you? I, I, I guess the closest is a loop, but I can't wear a loop without my glasses, so I just don't. Have you tried a monocle? Yeah. Why did you try a monocle? Is this you some know, weird sex party when story? One, <laughs> I went to a monocle sex party. It was monocles only to be worn. Hmm. When one grows up in England, one wears a monocle. Didn't you wear a monocle at St. Paul's? Surely. No, we wore glasses. It, you, it's, it's funny, man, because you are so St. Paul's. <laughs> it was weapons grade nerdery. It was. Is this I'm very the, proud of it. Is this in the nineties? Uh, yeah, nineties. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it would be young blood. <laughs> I want to call people young blood. Is that weird? A little weird. Is it? A little weird. Okay. You and I can use it, Phil. Just among ourselves. I've been, well, using, actually, with, I've been using it with Lulu. I go, "Good, good morning, young blood." When I wake her up, man, she goes, "Dad, make me food." <laughs> Well, if anyone asks, it's a vampire reference. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's what I'll say. Yeah, it's Twilight. It's from Twilight. <laughs> but wait, okay. So this will date us a little bit here in terms of when this comes out. But uh, obviously the Queen's Jubilee celebration is uh, soonish. Yeah. How do you guys feel about that? What? Mm. Do you have any feelings I, about that? I have no like you're both You're both felt like far enough removed from your upbringings. I've never been. Have you been very interested in... Uh... You're a real, you're, I mean, every time we talk, you're always going about the monarchy. You're always blathering, <laughs> Queen this, Prince Charles that. What's Harry wearing? I mean, I'm not trying to ruin your chances at knighthood. I'm just. Look at that ridiculous worsted that William was wearing with no stretch at all. <laughs> I don't know. 
I just don't care. Yeah. Feel no type of way. I guess it's cool. She's really old and she's still around. Good for her. I was good actually thinking her. she looked pretty good. I saw the Queen's Jubilee. Good for her. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> well done, madam. Good for her. Good, good for, for her. all of us. Good for her is peak English compliment. That's actually slightly embarrassingly effusive. <laughs> good for you, sir. <laughs> I do like the way people compliment each other in England. Because it's always sort of semi-abusive. Because being complimentary <laughs> is sort of is a bit embarrassing. Also patronizing, right? Well, they think it's a bit foreign. Oh. Like, oh, must be Italian, all those compliments. Or American. Mm, mm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for coming. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I would like, you know, I like that idea of the black linen rumple stilt skin thing. Yeah. As it's known in the trade. Yeah. That's it? What about footwear? I got to see it. Like, I, I could sort of imagine you in like these. Um... Do you have black linen rumply goods at the store? No, we do it custom because we actually sell very little like black things other than tuxedo. Even in New York? Yeah, just it's not really part of our standard look. But for certain people, we think it's great. What is part of the standard look? Beiges. The navy stuff. Yeah, navies, beiges, cream, stone, blue. Stone. Yeah. Do you stone have... is like a little yellower than off-white. Yeah. <laughs> See, I love that world you inhabit, man, because these are all serious conversations. Oh, yeah. The elasticity worsted. Yeah. What is worsted? <laughs> is worsted that, is, is a type some, of... Worsted some... refers to the yarn. So um, when you're talking about yarn, you can have woolen yarn or worsted yarn. And woolen yarn is a little fuzzier and worsted yarn has been processed to be a little bit... Um, it's not as fuzzy. It feels a little drier. And it's I a little can, more compact. I can see how this would be appealing to like the two-year-old. To the two-year-old of what? The, the two-year-old listening to this, making her go to sleep. But in the best oh, possible yeah. way, like it's a really, I like hearing the descriptions. I find it really admirable when you meet people who are so specific. Because I feel like, I don't know how often I come across people who know an incredible amount about a specific topic. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. do you, I mean, does that? I mean, when you find an expert, you know, like someone who has spent 10,000 plus hours doing one specific task. Right. But it's just so interesting just to hear that, like, you know about these things, that you know these things, and I have no idea what those things are, and I've never considered them. And I, I, like, I just like hearing the words and all that stuff. It's the descriptions. It's kind of fascinating to me. It's also kind of comforting. Because yeah. then you're like, I can just put, I can put stock in this person's opinion without second guessing it, oh. which I think is quite nice. I work with a lot of craftsmen. Crafts, craftspeople are a really important part of the business. Um, so we represent a lot of like just individual craftsmen who work at the highest level like, and uh, they basically don't want to see customers. They want to see customers twice a year mm -hmm. and they'll have their order book filled and that's good enough for them. Like and the, we deal with a lot of that. Like the Trouser people. King of Italy. Trouser King Italy is not... Trouser King Italy likes talking to people. But, you know, like some of our Japanese craftsmen are <laughs> like, eh, wait, he, who is the Trouser King of Italy? <laughs> Gianluca. Gianluca Migliorotti. Um, is this is like a friend of ours. He actually was a film director before. And then... Um, yeah. You know what? The film's pretty... What was the film about? He should, Which one? Like, There's a few. He, uh, he, uh, Epoichanapoli? What? Bless you. you want there's Epoichanapoli, there's E. Chloe D'Antonio, and there's Omast. And he actually has done some other films on, like, watched, other, in other fields, too. I watched one of them, but I forgot what it was about. Oh, was it like, Driving Dreams? Did oh, you watch maybe, Driving Dreams? Yeah, yeah, maybe that was it. That actually would be relevant to the people who listen to this podcast, not yeah. what I'm talking about. But Driving Dreams is a really great documentary. It talks about um, carriage makers, like Italian carriage makers, before oh, wow. they had CAD and stuff. And they're basically some hybrid of, like, a metalsmith and a sculptor. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. People made cu custom, well... Coach builders. Bespoke, yeah, coach, coach builders, builders. yeah. yeah. Okay. Carriage builders. And this, Sorry, coach builders. Uh, no, no, no. Well, no. But like, so, Get out. <laughs> but the, the Trouser King of Italy formerly was a film director. Oh, I mean, we nicknamed him the Trouser King of Italy. Just now, real. in fact. That nickname yeah. just happened out. <laughs> I got really excited. I was like, wow. It's like some guy who's like, he's the but king I met, of trousers. But I, I met him for coffee that day. And I have to say, it is. It, I'm finding it more and more dis dis disconcerting. I met him and he was wearing this glorious pair of like neon yellow trousers that were beautifully cut and and actually it I wore neon yellow socks on my very first date when I was 13 so I have a, a particular <laughs> affinity for that color and I went to pick up the girl and the doorman at the building mocked my outfit ruthlessly <laughs> and I remember exactly what I was wearing it's amazing you want to hear yeah please I was wearing um, wait you gotta start from the bottom 
Yeah. Okay. So for tra- for shoes, I was wearing these like turquoise pixie boots. What's a pixie boot? <laughs> they are pointed ankle high boots, but pointed toe. What year They're was called this? Pix- this is the eighties. This is mid. This is early. Oh, didn't they used to call those winkle pickers? No, w- winkle pickers are not the boot version. Oh, I see. I had. I was a big winkle picker fan later, and then brothel creepers. <laughs> But anyway, I was, wearing, I was wearing pixie boots, turquoise, uh, uh, the neon yellow socks, tight, really wide stripe, <laughs> white and blue trousers, vertical, uh, with a massive stripe that were very Kings Road punky at the time. Then I had a matching to the sh- shoes, turquoise <laughs> leather jacket, motorcycle jacket. Wow. And then I had a... Like some weird, like collarless baseball shirt in some blue with striped sleeves, <laughs> and I went, I went up and said, "I'd like to. I'm here to speak to meet Elizabeth Wells." And the door guy was like, "Good luck with that outfit, son." <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, uh, and then we went to see um, Blue Thunder. Was it? Or Airwolf? Do you know what I'm talking about? I know Airwolf. Airwolf, yeah. Blue Thunder was a version of Airwolf. I think it was with Jan Michael Vincent, but it was the movie version of Airwolf, I think. Oh. But she brought her friend. Oh. And her friend sat behind me. Oh. So I was sitting next to Elizabeth, and then, and then her friend was sitting behind me. Just like <sighs> chaperoning? I mean, clearly. Did you because of the outfit? <laughs> so they were saying it. So the outfit was like, you know what? Hang on, then just. Well, at least you up. got to sit with her. You could have yeah. been the one sitting in the back row instead. Yeah. That would have been much <laughs> worse. True. Yeah. God, that was the whole thing was traumatic. Well, do it you, makes for a good podcast story. Yeah. Do you not? Do you remember the very first date you went on? No. Come on, that's bullshit. probably because Everyone, it's so like it was last barely summer. counted as a date. Yeah, I just <laughs> lost my V card, <laughs> um, bro. <laughs> I don't know what it. Maybe I took my. I well. My girlfriend at the time would be my wife today, so I think I took her to a movie or something. Really? I think so. But how long have you been married? Mm. 12 years? 11 wow. years? Okay. No, 10 years? Do you remember the movie? Was it Airwolf? I think it was Monsters, Inc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You are romantic at heart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it could have been... Uh... I guess at least it wasn't like an Arnold Schwarzenegger action movie. I <laughs> 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 you see Commando. <laughs> God, do you guys remember that film with Sylvester Stallone? I'm sure I'm the only person who's... This is, I'm probably the only person right now who's referencing this film. Do you remember Over the Top? It was a film wasn't no. Sylvester Stallone made John? in the 80s. It was about arm, professional arm wrestling. But wasn't Jean huh. Claude Van Damme also in that? N- no. No? No. I want to Google this. Over the top. Yeah, with and his son was in it. And it was about mm-hmm. professional arm wrestling. I think he was a truck driver and he was a professional arm wrestler on the side to make some extra funds. I mean, and then, as you do. And then Skynet took over. <laughs> Different film. Yeah. Different oh, wait, either. fuck. <laughs> okay. Wow. Is it, is it, is it? Oh, see, it is. There you go. <laughs> it's a shame. We should watch that and just see what that's like. Okay. Let's do it tomorrow. For the next yeah. episode. Yeah, next, yeah. Epi- next episode will be me and, and you two guys, all three of us just watching over we the We can top. have it playing in the background. It could be a reaction thing. It'll be Mystery Science Theater. <laughs> it is amazing to me, the reaction thing, right? You know the reaction. Why don't you do reaction videos? I did do it once upon a time. My friend um, was an importer of uh, Japanese dry food rations. <gasps> and so I did a reaction video of that just because we were just starting the channel and we we're just messing with stuff. Wait, what oh, wouldn't it be wait, funny? Wait, hang on, hang on, hold on, hold on, Cho. Now yeah. look here. Uh, what are Japanese dried food rations? Like military rations? They're like nice military rations and you take them camping. Ah, so oh, like were you had were, camping food. So yeah. you were watching him eat them? No, I was eating them on camera oh. and reacting to it. Oh, was it like a. I burned muk- myself. Was it like a mukbang video? Yeah, I guess so. I love those. Do I don't know? get those. I can't get into that. No. That's because I showed you one in your heart. Okay, for just... people who don't know, mukbang is a South Korean thing where it's videos of people eating food. I think so. Yeah. And there's this amazing one I used to watch a lot called Bookie, Eating with Bookie. Is that the, the little girl? Well, she's not like she's four. 
She's no, she's a distracted South Korean woman, and she just eats these massive quantities of food. But there's this incredible ASMR sound happening, and also her comments are really funny. Like they pop up in little, you know, like closed captions. Really funny comments. Hmm. I was watching a, a. I was really into watching this guy eat、uh, military rations from all over the world.、Hmm. That was fascinating. Yeah, I bet. And then I got so into military rations, I decided to have a military rations brunch. How was it? And so everyone would come and they buy rations from like you know Russian special forces or Ita- Italy or South Korea or wherever, and we'd all and we and the cool thing about military rations is they all self heat. Yeah. So they cook themselves. Oh, weird. Yeah, but then we and then we and they were all so fucking disgusting. <laughs> we did it twice. We're like, this is disgusting. I feel like I feel miserable after. Well, I'll bring the set that my friend gave me because it was it was. Pretty decent, and at the time it was like right at the beginning of the pandemic, and you have to quarantine in Hong Kong if you're traveling, right? So the he was thinking, oh, I can sell these to people who are quarantining because the food was like pretty decent. Well, I'm sure they were. Like、yeah. it was like you know, kind of okay airport airline food. That's what it kind of. I actually、like. secretly really love airline food. You don't like it? No, I mean I find it. I find it. You know that I've scene, had good airline food. Yeah, like, especially like、uh, like the Asia based. Airlines. Yeah, the Asian ones are always way better.、Right. But you know what I find is, you know, in that scene in Two Thousand One: A Space Odyssey, he's on the shuttle and he gets that little pallet of food, and 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 it's all like in a square, in a rectangular. Con- you know what I'm talking about? <laughs>、yeah. I find that really comforting, and so I really like when you get this little rectangle with all these little food bits, and it's it's wow! I could oh my god! I can hear your neck cracking from、That's、here. Long damn it! Oh. oh, I think that I think that's our cue. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's it. Sorry, I'm sure you can edit that out. Should we do the English goodbye or the Irish goodbye? I think we do the, yeah. This is my thing. I just like to end a podcast abruptly and awkwardly. Oh, all right. Do you want to draw it out long further? We can have an awkward goodbye. We just sit in silence and call it a meditative podcast for a while. <laughs> Maybe that would really take off. People go, you know what, Phil? I like it when you don't really say anything. It's better. Okay, is that what's happening now? Okay. <laughs> Mark Cho, <laughs> thanks so much for coming. I feel, like we, we, I feel like we didn't get to talk enough stupid shit, but it's okay. Well, Next you, time you can talk. So, if you, is there anything in particular that's stupid you'd like to bring up before we sign off, man? No, I, I'm too sleepy. I can't、really? remember. Okay. Next time, I'll write it down. Next time. Okay. Yeah. Just, but listen, man. Thank you very much for having me because I really appreciate it. Man, thanks. I'm for sorry I, I put in such a poor performance. I'm like. Dance monkey, <laughs> it's fine, man. Look, you have a. I know you've been. You know you you have a crazy schedule and you're you know doing a lot of work and、mm. not sleeping well.、Mm. There's you, there's this crazy masturbatory schedule you've got going on at night, so、mm. that's keeping up a lot. Well, it keeps the the tensile strength. <laughs> I lo- I don't know what that phrase means, but I really like it.、Mm. You just have to throw it in. I saw that when I was, I don't know. I, I think I was watching、oh, was that show? Queer Eye. And there were some episodes. Oh, do you about, watch those? Do you watch a lot of? The, are there other? I don't watch that many shows, but my wife showed me Queer. I was like, oh, this is pretty. This is good. I really like this.、So、I started I, watching I, the new the new season. Yeah, I love that news. I love the, those. Well, I mean, they're not so new anymore. But I find there was an old crew, and then there's a new crew, and I love the new crew because I find it really.、Um, this is gonna. I'm gonna get a kick in the nuts things, but I find it very life affirming. Like I really yes, like them. I like.、Yeah. I like how they kind of. They're really joyous. Yeah, how could you not like them? Right. Yeah, and I actually especially like the home decor stuff because the guy's got a week to put that together, and、right. somehow it's like not terrible. Yeah.、Wow. Plus, some of the spaces are pretty interesting too. Yeah. And the guests are always interesting. They yeah, did, it's a really see, great show. They did the one. Do you see the one they did in Japan? I did. Yeah, that one was wonderful too. Yeah.、Mm. Yeah. And I also, and it's kind of. Glorious how they've sort of introduced sexuality into that whole thing. Like、mm. the, you know, the, I mean, they show up when they and to people's houses or towns who have clearly maybe not in, had much interaction with gay men before at all.、Mm. But they somehow managed to overcome that, and it just doesn't become a deal. Yeah, it's like you know, you're just, you're just nice to people, and usually people are nice back. Right.、Yeah. Usually. Usually. And then there's tensile strength. Should we end on that? <laughs> I look to you, Dad. I'll say yes. <laughs> Thanks, podcast dad. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Good job, kids. Thanks, Joe. It was a delight seeing you, man. It really was, and thanks for coming. I appreciate it. No, my pleasure. So we're gonna do the watch thing next, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, we're gonna try、um, and film a watch thing together someday called Walking s- Twatches. Someday means never. That's like in. You know, that's like. I thought in- we're doing next week. Okay, fine. <laughs> Why do you say next week, man? 
is I don't know I like time def- my schedule. I like definitive. <laughs> there you go. All right. All right. We're out.